Good morning. I'm Broadus Madison, and welcome to Uncanny Tales, Vancouver Public Library Story Time for Adults. I am uh, will be your reader today. We're broadcasting from the unceded homelands of the Musgroom, Squamish, and Swale of Tooth Nations. And my hope is for all of us to come together to reflect upon this land in which we work, live, and play. I also want to mention that I'm dedicating this program uh, here to all of our seniors and caregivers out there. We love you very much, and we miss you. Our first story today and you are lucky because I'm going to do two stories today. Uh, our first story is entitled The Thing in the Cellar by David H. Keller. This first appeared in 1932 in the magazine entitled Weird Tales. And yes, it, it's kind of weird. The interesting thing about uh, Mr. Keller was that he was actually a practicing psychiatrist. He worked at um, state facilities and back in those days he actually made more money writing these stories for various magazines than he did uh, in his practice. So, so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get into it. The Thing in the Cellar. It was a large cellar entirely out of proportion to the house above it. The owner admitted it was probably built for a distinctly different kind of structure from the one which rose above it. Probably the first house had been burned and poverty had caused a diminution of the dwelling erected to take its place. A winding stone stairway connected the cellar with the kitchen Around the base of this series of steps, successive owners of the house had placed their firewood, winter vegetables, and junk. The junk had gradually been pushed back till it rose head high in a barricade of uselessness. What was behind that barricade, no one knew and no one cared. For some hundreds of years, no one had crossed it to penetrate to the black reaches of the cellar behind it. At the top of the steps, separating the kitchen from the cellar, was a stout oaken door. The door was, in a way, as peculiar and out of relation to the rest of the house as the cellar. It was a strange kind of door, defined in a modern house, and certainly a most unusual door to find inside of the house. It was thick, stoutly built, dexterously rabbited together with huge wrought iron hinges and a lock that looked as though it came from castle despair. Separating a house from the outside world, such a door would be excusable. Swinging between kitchen and cellar, it seemed peculiarly inappropriate. From the earliest months of his life, Tommy Tucker seemed unhappy in the kitchen, in the front parlor, in the formal dining room, and especially on the second floor of the house, he acted like a normal, healthy child. But carry him to the kitchen, he at once began to cry. His parents, being plain, hard-working people, ate in the kitchen, except when they had company. Being poor, Mrs. Tucker did most of her work there, and thus much of her time was spent in the kitchen. And Tommy stayed with her at least as long as he was unable to walk. Much of the time, he was decidedly unhappy. When Tommy learned to crawl, he lost no time in leaving the kitchen. No sooner was his mother's back turned than the little fellow crawled as fast as he could for the doorway opening into the front of the house, the dining room, and the front parlor. Once away from the kitchen, he seemed happy, at least. At least he seemed to cry. On being returned to the kitchen, his howls so thoroughly convinced the neighbors that he had a cold that more than one bowl of catnip and sage tea 
was brought to his assistance. It was not until the boy learned to talk that the Tuckers had any idea as to what made the boy cry so hard when he was in the kitchen. In other words, the baby had to suffer for many months till he obtained at least a little relief. And even when told his parents, he told his parents what was the matter, they were absolutely unable to comprehend. This was not to be wondered at because they were both hardworking and extremely tired parents. What they finally learned from their little son was this, that if the cellar door was shut and securely fastened with the heavy iron, Tommy could at least eat a meal in the kitchen in peace. If the door was simply closed and not locked, he shivered with fear, but kept quiet. Oh, but if the door was open, if even the slightest streak of black showed that it was not tightly shut, then the little three-year-old would scream himself to the point of exhaustion, especially if his tired father would refuse him permission to leave the kitchen. Playing in the kitchen, the child developed two interesting habits. Rags, scraps of paper, and pieces of wood were continually being shoved under the thick oak door to fill the space between the door and the sill. Whenever Mrs. Tucker opened the door, there was always some trash there placed by her son. Oh, it annoyed the dickens out of her, and more than once the little fellow was thrashed for his conduct, but punishment acted in no way as a deterrent. The other habit was as singular. Once the door was closed and locked, he would rather boldly walk over to it and caress the old lock. Even when he was so small that he had to stand on tiptoe tip to touch it with the tips of his fingers, he would touch it with slow, caressing strokes. Later on, as he grew, he used to kiss it. Now his father, who only saw the boy at the end of the day, decided that there was no sense in such conduct and in his own masculine way tried to break the lad of his foolishness. There was, of necessity, no effort on the part of the hard-working man to understand the psychology behind his son's conduct. All that the man knew was that his little son was acting in a way that was decidedly strange. Tommy loved his mother and was willing to do anything he could to help her in the household chores, but one thing he would not do and never did do, and that was to fetch and carry something between the house and the cellar. If his mother opened the door, he would run screaming from the room, and he never returned voluntarily till he was assured that the door was closed. He never explained just why he acted as he did. In fact, he refused to talk about it, at least to his parents, and that was just as well, because had he done so, they would simply have been more positive than ever that there was something wrong with their only child. They tried, in their own ways, to break the child of his unusual habits, and failing to change him at all, they decided to ignore his peculiarities. That is, they ignored them until he became six years old, and that the time came for him to go to school. Now, Tommy was a sturdy little chap by that time, and more intelligent than the usual boys beginning in the primer class. Mr. Tucker was, at times, proud of him. The child's attitude toward the cellar was the one thing most disturbing to the father's pride. Finally, nothing would do but that the Tucker family call on the neighborhood physician. It was an important event in the life of the Tuckers, so important that it demanded the wearing of their Sunday finest and all that sort of thing. 
Well, the matter is just this, Dr. Hawthorne, said Mr. Tucker in a somewhat embarrassed manner. Our little Tommy is old enough to start school, but he behaves childish in regard to our cellar, and the missus and I thought you could tell us what to do about it. It's got to be his nerves. Now, ever since he was a baby, continued Mrs. Tucker, taking up the thread of conversation where her husband had passed. Tommy has a great fear of the cellar. Even now, big boy that he is, he doesn't love me enough to go fetch and carry something for me through that door and down those steps. It's not natural for a child to act like he does. And what with chinking the cracks with rags and kissing the lock and all, he drives me to the point where I fear he may become daft-like as he grows older. Now the doctor, eager to satisfy new customers and dimly remembering some lectures on the nervous system received when he was a young medical student, asked some general questions, listened to the boy's heart, examined his lungs, and looked at his eyes and fingernails. At last he commented, well, looks like a fine, healthy boy to me. Well, yeah, all except the cellar door, replied the father. Well, has he ever been sick? Mm, not but once or twice, when he cried himself blue in the face, answered the mother. Frightened? Uh, perhaps. It, it was always in the kitchen, doctor. Suppose you go out and let me talk to little Tommy by myself. And there sat the doctor very much at his ease and the little six-year-old boy looking very uneasy. Well now, Tommy, what is there in the cellar that you are afraid of? Well, I don't know. Well, have you ever seen it? No, sir. Have you ever smelt it, Tommy? N no, sir. Then how do you know there is something there? Because... Because what? Because there is. Well, that was as far as Tommy would go. And at last, his seeming obstinacy annoyed the physician, even as it had for several years annoyed Mr. Tucker. He went to the door and called the parents back into the office. Now he thinks there's something down in the cellar, he stated. The Tuckers simply looked at each other. Well, that's foolish, commented Mr. Tucker. Well, tis a plain cellar with junk and firewood and cider barrels in it, added Mrs. Tucker. Since we moved into that house, I have not missed a day without going down those stone steps, and I know there's nothing there. But the lad has always screamed when the door was open. I recall now that since he was a child in arms, he has always screamed when the door was open. He thinks there is something there, said the doctor. Well, darn nation, that's why we brought him to you, replied the father. It's the child's nerves. Uh, perhaps some foe tita or something will calm him down. I tell you what to do, advised the doctor. He thinks there is something there. Just as soon as he finds that he is wrong and that there is nothing there, he will forget about it. He has been humored too much by you two. What you do want to do is to open that cellar door and make him stay by himself in the kitchen. Nail the door open so he cannot close it. Leave him alone there for an hour and then go and laugh at him and show him how silly it was for him to be afraid of an empty cellar. I will give you some nerve and blood tonic, and that will help. But the big thing is to show him that there's nothing to be afraid of. On the way back to the Tucker home, Tommy broke away from his parents. They caught him after an exciting chase. 
and kept him between them the rest of the way home. Once in the house, he disappeared and was found in the guest room under the bed. The afternoon being already spoiled for Mr. Tucker, he determined to keep the child under observation for the rest of the day. Tommy ate no supper in spite of the urgings of the unhappy mother. The dishes were washed, the evening paper read, the evening pipe smoked, and then, and only then, did Mr. Tucker take down his toolbox and get out a hammer and some long nails. And I'm going to nail the door open, Tommy, so you can not close it, as that was what the doctor said. And Tommy, listen to me. You are to be a man and stay here in the kitchen alone for an hour, and we will leave the lamp a burning, and then, when you find there is nothing to be afraid of, you will be well and a real man and not something for a father to be ashamed of. But at the last, Mrs. Tucker kissed Tommy and cried and whispered to her husband not to do it and to wait till the boy was larger, but nothing was to do except nail the door open so it could not be shut and leave the boy there alone with the lamp burning and the dark open space of the doorway to look at. Now, that same day, Dr. Hawthorne took supper with a classmate of his, a man who specialized in psychiatry and who was particularly interested in children. Hawthorne told Johnson about his newest case, the little Tucker boy, and asked him for his opinion. Dr. Johnson frowned. Well, children are odd, Hawthorne. Perhaps they are like dogs. It may be that their nervous system is more acute than in the adult. We know that our eyesight is limited, also our hearing and smell. I firmly believe that there are forms of life which exist in such a form that we can neither see, hear, nor smell them. Fondly, we often delude ourselves into the fallacy of believing that they do not exist because we cannot prove their existence. Now this Tucker lad may have a nervous system that is particularly acute. He may dimly appreciate the existence of something in the cellar, which is unappreciable to his parents. Evidently, there is some basis to this fear of his. Now, I'm not saying that there's anything in the cellar. In fact, I suppose that it's just an ordinary cellar. But this boy, since he was a baby, has thought there was something there and that is just as bad as though there were actually were. Now, what I would like to know is what makes him think so? Why don't you give me the address and I will call tomorrow and have a talk with the little man. Well, what do you think of my advice? Said Dr. Hawthorne. <laughs> well, sorry, old man, but I think it was perfectly rotten. Now, if I were you, I would stop around there on my way home and prevent them from following it. The little fellow may be badly frightened. You see, he evidently thinks there is something there. But there isn't. Well, perhaps not. No doubt he's wrong, but he thinks so. Now, it all worried Dr. Hawthorne so much that he decided to take his friend's advice. It was a cold night, a foggy night, and the physician felt cold as he tramped along the London streets. At last, he came to the Tucker house. He remembered now that he had been there once before, long ago, when little Tommy Tucker came into the world. There was a light in the front window, and in no time at all, 
Mr. Tucker came to the door. Well, I've come to see little Tommy, said the doctor. Well, he's in the back kitchen, replied the father. He gave one cry, but since then he has been absolutely quiet, sobbed the wife. Well, if I had let her have her way, she would have opened the darn door. But I said to her, Mother, now's the time to make a man out of our Tommy. And I guess he knows by now that there was nothing to be afraid of. Anyway, the hour is up. Suppose we go and get him out and put him to bed. Oh, it has been a hard time for the little child, whispered his wife. Carrying the candle, the man walked ahead of the woman and the doctor, and at last opened the kitchen door. The room was dark. Well, I guess the lamp has gone out, said the man. Wait till I light it. Tommy! Tommy! cried Mrs. Tucker. But the doctor ran to where a white form was stretched on the floor. Sharply, he called for more light. Trembling, he examined all that was left of little Tommy. Twitching, he looked into the open space, down into the cellar. At last, he looked at Tucker and Tucker's wife. Tommy, uh, Lord, Tommy has been hurt. I guess he's dead, he stammered. The mother threw herself on the floor and picked up the torn, mutilated thing that had been only a little while ago, her little Tommy. The man took his hammer and drew out the nails and closed the door and locked it and then drove in a long spike to reinforce the lock. And then he took hold of the doctor's shoulders and shook him viciously. What killed him, doctor? What killed him? He shouted into Hawthorne's face. The doctor looked at him bravely, in spite of the fear in his throat. Well, how do I know, Tucker? He replied. How do I know? Didn't you tell me that there was nothing there, nothing down there, in the cellar? Well, poor Tommy. I guess uh, probably the moral in this story is, is always get a second opinion. Poor Tommy. Anyway, that was, I hope you enjoyed that one. We're scared out of, the Dickens scared out of you on that one. Before we start our second story, though, I want to give a special shout out to the residents and caregivers of Opal by Element. We so look forward to you uh, coming back to us when we open up again. And thank you so much for listening. Uh, to our program today. So out there, if you have anybody that you would like to have a shout out sent, I'll give you the instructions at the end on how to do that. But I'd love uh, calling out uh, people in our community. All right. So Opal by Element, residents and staff, happy Friday. Now, our second story was written in 1935 by Alfred Noyes, and it's called Midnight Express. I think you'll like this one as well. It was a battered old book, bound in red buckram. He found it when he was just 12 years old on an upper shelf in his father's library, and against all the rules, he 
he took it to his bedroom to read by candlelight when the rest of the rambling old Elizabethan house was flooded with darkness. That was how young Mortimer always thought of it. His own room was a little isolated cell in which, with stolen candle ends, he could keep the surrounding darkness at bay while everyone else had surrendered to sleep and allowed the outer night to come flooding in. By contrast with those unconscious ones, his elders, it made him feel intensely alive in every nerve and fiber of his young brain. The ticking of the grandfather clock in the hall below, the beating of his own heart, the long drawn rhythmical ah of the sea on the distant coast, all filled him with a sense of overwhelming mystery. And as he read, the soft thud of a blinded moth striking the wall above the candle would make him start and listen like a creature of the woods at the sound of a cracking twig. The battered old book had the strangest fascination for him, though he never quite grasped the thread of the story. It was called the Midnight Express, and there was one illustration on the 50th page at which he could never bear to look. It frightened him. Young Mortimer never understood the effect of that picture on him. He was an, an imaginative, but not a neurotic youngster, and he avoided the 50th page as he might have hurried past a dark corner on the stairs when he was six years old, or as the grown man on the lonely road in the ancient mariner who, having once looked round, walks on and turns no more his head. There was nothing in the picture, apparently, to account for this haunting dread. Darkness, indeed, was its chief characteristic. It showed an empty railroad platform at night, lit by a single dreary lamp. An empty railway platform that suggested a deserted and lonely junction in some remote part of the country. There was only one figure on the platform, the dark figure of a man standing almost directly under the lamp with his face turned away towards the black mouth of a tunnel which, for some strange reason, plunged the imagination of the child into a pit of horror. The man seemed to be listening. His attitude was tense, expectant, as though he were awaiting some fearful tragedy. There was nothing in the text so far the child read and could understand to account for this waking nightmare. He could neither resist the fascination of the book nor face that picture in the stillness and loneliness of the night. He pinned it down to the page facing it with two long pins so that he should not come upon it by accident. Then he determined to read the whole story through, but always before he came to page 50, he fell asleep and the outlines of what he had read were blurred, and the next night he had to begin all over again, and again, and again, before he came to the 50th page, he fell asleep. He grew up and forgot all about the book and the picture, but halfway through his life, at that strange and critical time when Dante entered the dark wood, leaving the direct path behind him, he found himself a little before midnight, waiting for a train at a lonely junction. And as the station clock began to strike 12, he remembered, remembered like a man awakening from a long dream. There, 
under the single dreary lamp on the long glimmering platform was the dark and solitary figure that he knew. Its face was turned away from him towards the black mouth of the tunnel. It seemed to be listening, tense, expectant, just as it had been 38 years ago. But he was not frightened now as he had been in childhood. He would go up to that solitary figure, confront it, and see the face that had so long been hidden, so long averted from him. He would walk up quietly and make some excuse for speaking to it. He would ask it, for instance, if the train was going to be late. Now, it should be easy for a grown man to do this, but his hands were clenched tightly when he took the first step, as if he too were tense and expectant. Quietly, but with the old, vague instincts awakening, he went toward the dark figure under the lamp, passed it, swung round abruptly to speak to it, and saw, without speaking, without being able to speak, it was himself, staring back at himself, as though in some mocking mirror, his own eyes alive in his own white face, looking into his own eyes alive. The nerves of his heart tingled as though their own electric currents would paralyze it. A wave of panic went through him. He turned, gasped, stumbled, broke into a blind run, out through the deserted and echoing ticket office, on to the long, moonlit road behind the station. The whole countryside seemed to be utterly deserted. The moonbeams flooded it with the loneliness of their own deserted satellite. He paused for a moment and heard, like the echo of his own footsteps, the stumbling run of something that followed over the wooden floor within the ticket office. Then he abandoned himself shamelessly to his fear and ran, sweating like a terrified beast, down the long white road between the two endless lines of ghostly poplars, each answering another into what seemed like a long straight canal in which one of the lines of poplars was again endlessly reflected. He heard the footsteps echoing behind him. They seemed to be slowly but steadily gaining upon him. A quarter of a mile away, he saw a small white cottage by the roadside, a white cottage with two dark windows and a door that somehow suggested a human face. He thought to himself that if he could reach it in time, he might find shelter and security, escape. The thin, implacable footsteps echoing his own were still somewhere way off when he lurched, gasping, into the little porch, rattled the latch, thrust at the door, and found it locked against him. There was no bell or knocker. He pounded on the wood with this fist until his knuckles bled. The response was horribly slow. At last he heard heavier footsteps within the cottage. Slowly they descended the creaking stair. Slowly the door was unlocked. A tall shadowy figure stood before him, holding a lighted candle in such a way that he could see little either of the holder's face or form. But to his dumb horror, there seemed to be a cerecloth wrapped around the face. No words passed between them. The figure beckoned him in, and as he obeyed, it locked the door behind him. Then, beckoning him again without a word, the figure went before him up the crooked stair, with the ghostly candle casting huge and grotesque shadows on the whitewashed walls and ceiling. They entered an upper room, 
in which there was a bright fire burning with an armchair on either side of it and a small oak table on which there lay a battered old book bound in dark red buckram. It seemed as though the guest had long been long expected and all things were prepared. The figure pointed to one of the armchairs, placed the candlestick on the table by the book, for there was no other light but that of the fire, and withdrew without a word, locking the door behind him. Mortimer looked at the candlestick. It seemed familiar. The smell of the guttering wax brought back the little room in the old Elizabethan house. He picked up the book with trembling fingers. He recognized it at once, though he had long forgotten everything about the story. He remembered the ink stain on the title page, and then with a shock of recollection, he came on the 50th page, which he had pinned down in childhood. The pins were still there. He touched them again. Oh, the very pins which his trembling childish fingers had used so long ago. He turned back to the beginning. He was determined to read the end now and discover what it was all about. He felt that it must be all set down there in print, and though in childhood he could not understand it, he would be able to fathom it now. It was called The Midnight Express, and as he read the first paragraph, it began to dawn upon him slowly, fearfully, inevitably, it was the story of a man who, in childhood long ago, had chanced upon a book in which there was a picture that frightened him. He had grown up and forgotten it, and one night, upon a lonely railway platform, he had found himself in the remembered scene of the picture. He had confronted the solitary figure under the lamp, recognized it, and fled in panic. He had taken shelter in a wayside cottage, had been led to an upper room, found the book awaiting him, and had begun to read it right through to the very end at last. And this book, too, was called The Midnight Express. And it was the story of a man who, in childhood, it would go on thus, forever and forever and forever. There was no escape. But when the story came to the wayside cottage, for the third time, a deeper suspicion began to dawn upon him, slowly, fearfully, inevitably. Although there was no escape, he could at least try to grasp more clearly the details of the strange circle the fearful wheel in which he was moving. There was nothing new about the details. They had been there all the time, but he had not grasped their significance. That was all. The strange and dreadful being that had led him up the crooked stair. Who and what was that? The story mentioned something that had escaped him. The strange host, who had given him shelter, was about his own height. Could it be that he was also, and was this why the face was hidden? At the very moment when he asked himself that question, he heard the click of the key in the locked door. The strange host was entering, moving toward him from behind, casting a grotesque shadow, larger than human, on the white walls in the guttering candlelight. It was there, seated on the other side of the fire, facing him with a horrible nonchalance, 
as a woman might prepare to remove a veil. It raised its hands to unwind the cerecloth from its face. He knew to whom it would belong. But would it be dead or living? There was no way out but one. As Mortimer plunged forward and seized the tormentor by the throat, his own throat was gripped with the same brutal force. The echoes of their strangled cry were indistinguishable, and when the last confused sounds died out together, the stillness of the room was so deep that you might have heard the ticking of the old grandfather clock and the long-drawn, rhythmical ah of the sea on a distant coast 38 years ago. But Mortimer had escaped at last. Perhaps, after all, he had caught the Midnight Express. It was a battered old book bound in red buckram. Well, poor Mortimer, poor Tommy. <laughs> anyway, we hope you enjoyed today's stories and that instills in you the love of reading aloud to your family, friends, or loved ones. Go ahead and give it a try at home. Find a story, open it up, and just start reading aloud. I think you'll like it. None of this uh, that happened today, uh, and I want to say this from the bottom of my heart, none of this would have been possible uh, uncanny tales without our dynamic duo of Leah and Megan working behind the scenes uh, to bring you this story. Thank you very much uh, from the bottom of my heart. Let us hear back from you uh, via our feedback link that's going to go into our chat or drop us an email at programs at vpl.ca. We have an upcoming event that I think that you'll like. It's called uh, Cook and Tell, and it's on March 24th at 10.30 a.m. Check us out in, our, uh, in the link there. Uh, check that out. Uh, I enjoyed it, listening to stories about uh, kitchen adventures, basically. And I'm the kind of person that uh, has been known to burn water, so, and I enjoyed it myself. So go ahead and tune into that. Uh, bring your recipes, bring your stories, bring your cookbooks. Our next adventure is going to be on March 26 at 10 a.m. Same place, same time. So, uh, from all of us here at Uncanny Tales, until next time, take care. And watch your back.